Okay, this is um, a, uh, another logic design video. This is for the uh, 17th of April. So we're cruising along. We really just have three more weeks and semester is over. I believe that's correct. Um, let me just double check to make sure. Yes, one, two, three more weeks. So that is it. Um, so anyway, today we're going to cover chapter 13, uh, and we'll see. We may I may get through that pretty quickly. And uh, Monday, I'll definitely uh, start on chapter 14. So um, so we'll just launch into this. Um, okay, and uh, so let me just do that here, and we'll do that. Okay, great. Now, um, so here we are, 13, and basically. Uh, here's what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about this parity checker. We already we already started the parity checker, so I'm I'm only going to briefly mention this. It's pretty simple anyway. Um, and then we'll do this analysis by signal tracing and timing charts. And we'll, the reason we're going to do that is I want you to see the issue uh, that that will sort of reveal about when to read the outputs of a Mealy uh, machine. Remember we have two basic machines when it comes to the the digital things uh, we have more and mealy and the more uh, our outputs only depend on what state we're in whereas mealy our outputs depend on what state we're in plus the next inputs that come in so we have to read the mealy outputs just before the next active clock edge to guarantee that our new inputs have arrived and are stable and uh, this makes mealies a little more complicated because of uh, the limitations on when you can when you have to read it. So that is a let, let me shrink this down. So that is one uh, one of the problems. Okay, um, so we'll do that, uh, and then I'm going to back up. So remember these are these are the charts that you kind of need to know for designing with flip flops. Now almost all our designs are going to be with D flip flops from here on out. So you really don't have to memorize any of these, but they're all really simple, right? So the SR, you just have to remember that S and R both can't be one, and that S sets and R resets. So if you want to stay at zero, you can't have S be one. If you want to stay at one, you can't have R be one. And then the in between, if you want to go from zero to one, then S has to be one, and since R, it could be a don't care, except for the fact that they can't both be one, so it has to be zero. Whereas with the JK, J and K can both be one, so in that case, your J has to be one to go from zero to one, and your K is a don't care. If they're both one, it toggles. If J is one and K is zero, it sets. And then the opposite, if you go from one to zero, J has to be, uh, J can be a don't care, but K must be a one. And if you're holding at zero, J has to be a zero, K is a don't care. If you're holding at one, K is a zero and J is a don't care. So that, that all makes total logic sense. And then then if you take the JK, the the top and the bottom really represent the T flip-flop. So if we're going to hold at zero, T is zero. If we're going to hold at one, T is zero. And if we're going to toggle either direction, T is one. Toggling from zero to one, T has to be one. Toggling from one to zero, T has to be one. And then the D is the simplest of all. Whatever you want the Q to be, that's what D has to be. And this column doesn't even matter. So we don't care what the flip-flop is now. If we want it to be clear, we, we make D zero. And if we want it to be set, we make D one. Pretty much end the story. All right, so uh, since we're mostly gonna design with Ds, we don't actually have to do uh, extra columns in our state table. We can just use the next state columns and that will work perfectly fine. All right, so uh, parity checker. So we already did this one. Again, I'm just gonna go through it quickly. So it's a little bit of a contrived problem because we don't have um, the normal features of a parity checker that we would have here. The normal features of a parity checker would, would have some way to read in a fixed number of bits and then check the parity. Read in another fixed number of bits and check the parity. And any time we found that the parity for a group of bits was wrong, then we would request the, the bits to be reset. This parity checker doesn't do that. 
it just takes a continual stream of, of data coming in and keeps track of whether we uh, have an odd number of ones so far or an even number of ones. And this just goes on forever. Um, the output is just zero or one based on whether or not we have an even number so far or an odd number so far. And we this could run for days and days, apparently, which really isn't how a parity checker is supposed to work. It, it should work on groups of bits. Uh, because in the output, we're going to adjust those groups of bits so that we make sure for that group of bits, the parity is either odd, if that's what we're specified, or even if that's what's been specified as the, the proper parity. Uh, and then that does give us a chance to send an error signal back and request uh, a resend. Okay. So we're going to, because we use the T flip flop, uh, well, here's our state graph. Again, our state graph is very simple. We, uh, we have two states, S0, where our, our output Z is 0, which means even parity, and state S1, where our output Z is 1, which means odd parity, which, which means we have an odd number of bits, and here it means we have an even number of bits. Now, when you actually use parity in the way it's meant to be used, you don't have even an odd parity mixed together. You either have, you either say every eight bits will have an even number of ones. That would be even parity. So you count up every eight bits that come in, and if you get an even number of ones, you know it's probably good, uh, unless two bits got switched or something. If on the other hand it has an odd number of ones, you know you have a problem. Somewhere there's a mistake, and you need to get that byte sent again. And that's how parity works. In this particular problem, it's not a perfect problem, it's a little screwed up, but we're but it's really more just to illustrate a point. And the point is, this is the first problem that we've done where where our our uh, system has a, a clock coming in here and also has a data input here and an output here. Before we just did this counter. We did a sequential counter where it counted from zero up to seven and back to zero and repeated over and over. And we did a non-sequential counter where we where we counted uh, some funny sequence and uh, then back to the beginning of that sequence again, uh, but not necessarily in order at all. This is the first time that we have an actual input. There, there's an input x, and we also have a clock as an input. The other problem had a clock as an input, but that's not really considered the input like x is, and. The other one, we had the state of our flip-flops, but we didn't really have an output Z. In this case, we do have an output Z, which represents the parity. If Z is 0, we have even parity, and if Z is 1, we have odd parity. At least that's what we're going to uh, insist comes out of this. That's how we want, to, want this to run. All right, and you can see down here, uh, here's our clock, and here's our, our odd parity and even parity. Okay, so... So, so here we have the, the circuit. So it, it turns out we're going to use a T flip flop for this one. And here's our state graph. So if we're in the present state of S0, and we can also get exactly the same information off the state graph here. So if we're in S0 and we, and we get a, a 0, that does not change us from even parity to odd parity. So we stay here. We're still in even parity. But if we get a 1, now we go to S1, which represents even parity. Remember, er the nodes always mean something, okay? And in this case, Z equals one, because that means we have an odd number of ones. And then we stay here if we get another zero, but if we get another one, now we have an even number of ones that puts us back to S0. We stay here if we get a zero, but if we get a one, we go into S1. So with a string of ones, we just go back and forth. If every time we get a zero, we just kind of mark time and stay where we are. And that's the state graph. This is the state table, same idea. Present state, S0 means we're in even parity. Next state, if X is zero, we stay there. If it's one, we go to S1. And we output a zero whenever we're in S0 because we consider it even parity. In S1, if we get a zero, we stay there. We still have odd parity. And if we get a X equals one, now that makes us an even parity. So we go to S0. And if we are odd and... Uh, uh, let's see. Well, if if we're, yeah, I don't know. If if we're in, if we're uh, 
in even parity and we get a one, then then obviously we we um, if we're in odd parity and we get a one, we're going to go to even parity as zero. Okay. Here are the outputs, and lo and behold, this is a, a fairly simple problem because uh, when we do the K map here, we, first we have to substitute in uh, one flip flop. If it's if the flip flop is zero, we're in state zero. If the flip flop is one, we're in state S one. And so basically, uh, we just have this one flip flop, and it turns out that uh, that our x can just go straight into the t input. If x is zero, then we're going to stay in the st in the uh, parity that we're in. If it's one, we're going to change parities. We're going to toggle. So that's how the t flip flop works. So it's a good solution for this problem. So here's our state table. Now we substitute in for our, our one flip flop. Uh, S0 equals 0, S1 equals 1, and our output is 0, 1. And then if we look at our T input, it's 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 always 0 when X is 0, it's always 1 when X is 1. So if we draw a little uh, K map using our two variables, one variable is our input X, and the other variable is our flip flop. Normally we always use the flip flops and the inputs for the variables. And, uh, and so this is the little two variable K map. And you'll notice here that uh, we have, if we loop these two, that would equal x. So the t input should just have be driven by x. And indeed, that's what we see here. And that answers the, uh, answers the mail as far as this problem is concerned. OK, um, so we've talked a, a little bit about the Moore and Mealy machines. I'm going to, uh, I'll hammer that point uh, on every problem we work from here on out. Um, I want you to totally understand the difference. And then in just a second, we're going to look at two circuits, one more and one melee, and we're going to understand why, why there can be false outputs when you read a melee if you don't read it at the right time. All right. And it, when I first started looking at this, it really did confuse me quite a bit. Um, so let me just go through these points, and then I want to make a couple of additional points. With the more, um, the output function... The output is a function of the present state only. So you look at the flip-flops, whatever, whatever state they're showing, that determines the outputs. And because of that, they're associated with whatever state we're in. So if we're, let's say we have four states, S0, S1, S2, S3. As soon as you know what state you're in, you know what your outputs would be. And the outputs can only change with the clock pulse. Of course, you have to wait a teeny propagation delay after the clock, and then you can read them. But, but between essentially each clock pulse, the outputs are good until the next clock pulse. The melee, on the other hand, it does not work that way. It is a function not only of the current state that you're in, but of the next input, the next, the next input that's going to come into your, in, into your uh, network. And so you don't know what your current output should be until you get the next input. So in a very real sense, Mealy is, is a forward-looking circuit. It's always looking at the next input, and it doesn't know what the correct output is until it gets that new next input. Then when the, then when the clock changes, you're kind of in a no-man's land waiting for the next inputs after that clock edge before you know what your correct output should be. Because again, Mealy is forward-looking, and it's always waiting. It's dependent on the next input which happens before the next clock, because when the next clock arrives, the inputs have to be there and be good in order to, let, to get the, the, the uh, correct transition of, of any of the uh, flip-flops in the circuit. Okay, so a Mealy machine, the output function depends on present state and the next input. And that in the state graph, that means the output is not associated with the node, which basically is, is the same as the state. It's associated with the connecting links. And the output can change between clock pulses when the new inputs arrive. In fact, it, well, it doesn't always change, I guess, but it certainly could change. But you, will, you have no confidence that you have the right output until that in, new input arrives. Only then, then can you calculate the correct uh, updated outputs. And um, the output can also change when the clock hits. But when it changes with the clock, 
you don't know if that's a correct output or a false output until the next state, till the next inputs come in and are stable for just a second. So again, you can only read the outputs of a Mealy machine just before the next active clock edge. If you read them too early, they may they may be wrong, and you have to so that you have to provide circuitry that keeps you from reading the outputs any sooner than you than right before the next clock edge. All right. So now we're going to do these signal tracing and timing charts. And uh, I'm just going to talk through these points. But basically, uh, here's the circuit. So this is a Moore machine. What we're going to do, we're going to, uh, we're going to assume some initial values for the flip-flop. So how many flip-flops do we have? We have flip-flop A up here, and we have flip-flop B down here. Notice this has an active low set and an active low reset, and it has a falling edge clock. This has an active low set and an active low reset and a falling edge clock. The set and the resets are not connected to anything. We're not going to use them in this problem. The clock, the fact that it has a falling edge, no really, no big difference, uh, but duly noted. And then we have uh, an exclusive OR gate here with a bar and then a second bar. We have another exclusive OR gate here with a bar and a second bar. And we have a, uh, a just a simple OR gate here. Okay, so what we do, uh, I'm going to use the little um, uh, pointer, and I'll write on the screen. So I'm going to assume, just right off the bat, that flip-flop A, that this flip-flop is a 1. And I'll assume, oh, no, wait, can't do that. A, they're both 0, my bad. So I'm, let me change this to a 0. That's a 0, and we'll assume that one's a 0, too. Okay, there we go. Both A and B are zero. And if you look, that corresponds to here. And then the next input, or the first input, is X equals zero. So, we, so we're going to say X equals zero. Now B prime would be a one. X is a zero. And A, not A, not A prime, but just A, is a zero. Because flip-flop A is set at zero. Okay, now if you put a 1 and a 0 into an exclusive OR gate, you get a 1 out. So this D input is a 1. And if you put two zeros in, you get a 0 out. Now, that's great. So then when the next clock hits, this D input is going to change this flip-flop. It's going to go to a 1. But this flip-flop is going to stay at 0. All right, if this flip-flop is, oh, and the output, when they're both zero, the output is zero. And we can see that right here. That's the starting point. All right, now, on this clock edge, this flip-flop goes to a one. So now we have a one down here for this exclusive OR gate. Right here, so we have a, we have a, a one here, and we have a zero here. So the output then is going to go from 0 to 1. The, um, yeah. So, so it won't be 0 anymore. It'll be 1. Okay, now what happens next? Okay, so that, that takes care of, so now here we are. Uh, our, our current state of A is 1, our current state of B is 1, and our next input is a 1. All right, so now, oh, oh I, did, I have to reflect these over. So this is X, B prime, that's still 0 and 1. X, A, this is a 1 now, so this is actually a 1. And our new X uh, is also a 1, so I'm going to cross this out and put a 1. Now, two ones going in, it's going to make this a zero. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, sk I skipped the clock. The clock's going to hit, and this is going to be a one. This is, and this is going to be a, uh, yeah, so this input's a one, so this is going to stay at one. And this is going to be, uh, no. Uh, it, this is just drives me crazy, and it's mostly because it's such a pain to write these things with this stupid thing. All right, 
Okay, let's uh, let's let's start over. See if we can get this correct. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, we're going to start everything at zero. And let's see, let's get these get these done. Okay, all right now. And do that. All right, and maybe we'll do this too. All right, get back to my pointer. Let's do it again. See if we can get this to make sense. Okay, the first, the very first value, um, a is zero, b is zero. So b prime is one. Our first value of x is zero. We're starting with an assumed value of for flip flop a is zero, an assumed value of flip flop b is zero, and then x is zero, and a is zero. All right. So on the other side, this is just an OR gate, and I've also got that messed up too. It's not an exclusive OR. So there's a zero there for the input, but this is exclusive OR. One and zero gives us a one. All right. Now the clock hits. When the clock hits, oh, and and the output also. Uh, two zeros on the clock on the output and the output starts off at zero zero here and zero there all right then um, then the clock hits this inputs a one so this is going to go to one this inputs zero so it's going to stay at zero the a then down here becomes a one and the next x is also a one And this x here becomes a 1, but this b prime is still a 1. So this flip-flop here is going to go to 0. We'll cross that out. Or the, the input's going to be 0, I should say. And the input here is also going to be 0. This is 0 because we have two 1s, and this is 0 because... Uh, no, wait, did I say that wrong? Yeah, we have two ones here. It's just an OR gate, so this will be a 1. All right, the output then, because this 1 here is already a 1. So now so now we have a, a 1 for the output. We have a 0. We have a 0 for B. We have a 1 for A, and our input's a 1. All right, the clock hits. When the clock hits... This zero crosses this one out, and now we have a zero here again. This one crosses this zero out, and now we have a one for here. Okay, the new x, uh, the, new, the new output then is going to stay at one because now we have a one here and a zero there, so that's fine. The new x is going to be a one, so it's going to be a one here. The b prime is going to be a zero. So this is no longer going to be a zero. It's going to be a one. And uh, the x is a one. So this is going to be a one. When the clock and, and, and the output is going to stay at one. When the clock hits, the one here is going to make this a one. So it's going to stay at one. The one here is going to turn this zero into a one. And these two ones are going to cancel on the exclusive OR gate and make this then a zero. So the output then is a zero. And we just keep tracking along like this. Okay, but the nice thing is whatever the state of the flip-flop is, is going to determine the output. Because notice the output is only connected to the flip-flops. The input X doesn't play. All right, now I'm going to erase this ink and we're going to go on to the next one. All right. Well, well, we'll do this. So this this shows it in timing diagram form. Uh, okay. So here's so here's here's our x. Our first value is zero. Our a is currently at zero. Our b is at zero, and our output is at zero. Then the clock hits. This is the clock edge right here. And at that clock edge, then with a little propagation delay, Z goes to 1. 
and then the uh, the new input X is a one, and then when the clock hits the next time, the A becomes a one, B stays at zero, and the output Z goes to a one. And you can see we just follow it along here. So, uh, and that's this is the type of diagram that we normally generate by simulating uh, this circuit. Okay, so. Uh, let me erase all the ink on this side. And now we're going to go to the next circuit. Now this is an example of a Mealy machine. Now let me just say right off the bat, whenever I first read this problem, I foolishly assumed that there was some connection between the two problems. There is not. They have nothing to do with each other. One's, a, one's an arbitrary Moore machine, the other's an arbitrary Mealy machine. And they don't do the same things. So. So don't worry about that part. All right. So this also has two flip-flops, though, two JKs. It also has uh, one input X and one output Z. But it's a totally different problem. This one has three AND gates driving this one OR gate and two AND gates driving the J, the J an AND gate driving the J and, and X into K, and here an X into J and an AND gate into K. And this AND gate has B and X, and this one has A and X. And you see the combinations here, B prime X, AX, and B X prime, A prime. All right, so in any event, um, uh, so so here we are. And uh, so we start off and we have assumed values for A and B. So we have zero for A, zero for B. All right, and then we assume an output for Z. Well, we, we measure the output for Z and then, uh, and then X. So our, our first x is a 1, so we, we make x a 1. We make b 0. We make a 0. It's a big 0. And we make uh, uh, x is a 1. So this AND gate puts a 0 into j. And the x is a 1. This x is a 1, and this AND gate puts a 0 into k. Now, what happens here is that the... Um, so this flip-flop has a 0 for j and a 1 for k. So on the next clock edge, it's going to stay at 0. This jk has a 1 for j and a 0 for k. So on the next clock edge, it's going to 1. Okay, And then the current output... We have a B prime, so that's a 1. We have an X, that's a 1. So we get a 1 down here, so the output's a 1. And that's what we see right here. Now, when the new... Uh, okay, so that's where we are, right before the clock edge hits. Because that's our this X is our new X. Now the clock edge hits, and it takes, the, takes this flip-flop and leaves it at 0. So the A stays at 0. But the J here is a 1, and so this flip-flop goes to 1. So here we see that change. A stays at 0, but B goes to 1. Now, before we can figure out our output, well, so a couple of things. One, uh, we still have the old X. We're waiting for the new X to come in. And uh, when, so the current X is a 1, and B is a... Uh, but now B is a 1, so B prime is a 0. So this gate now puts out a 0. And before, A was a 0, and B was a 0. So these, these were all putting out zeros. So, so when this happens, our output goes down to 0 for a short time. And then when the new input comes, X, then, then uh, so we look and see what happens. Well... Uh, the new input X comes and it's a 0. So that's a 0 here. It's a 0 here. But it's a 1 here. A prime is a 1. And B, actually I marked that wrong, B is a 1. But before the X turns, it's a 1, so that X prime would be 0. So, so it goes down to 0, but, but then when the new input of X equals 1 comes in, it goes back to 
1. So we have a short time where the output drops to 0, even though it's not supposed to, while we're waiting for the new input uh, to come in, which is x equals 0, which then turns this into a 1. And, uh, and so that, that 0 that's output for a short time is, is considered a false output. That's why we do not read Mealy networks until just before the next clock edge. Now the next clock edge hits, well, we have to see what's going on here. So a, a, a b is 1. So now we have, now we have uh, this 0 is a 1. And then this a is a 0. And that x is a uh, 0. So these are both 0. So the k is going to be 0. The j is going to be 0. And here the j is going to be 0 and the x is 0, right? And so that x will be 0. So the x is, so all the flip-flops are 0. So at the next clock, the flip-flops are going to 0. So a is 0, b is 0. So that's going to go to 0. And then, uh, so b prime will be 1. And then the next, so, but x is 0, so that's a 0. A is, uh, a is 0, x is 0, so that's a 0. And uh, b is 0, uh, a is 1, x prime is 1. Now when the new x comes in, we're going to have uh, 1 and 1 here. So this is going to go to 1, and the output's going to go, uh, going to stay at 1. In the meantime, though, the output is... Uh, the output it goes down to zero again, so we have we have another potentially false output of zero, and then it goes back up to one. All right, so hopefully you're getting the idea. I I'm getting uh, cross-eyed doing this, so I'm going to delete all this. Uh, hopefully, so here's what we see in the uh, here's what we see. We see a uh, a false output uh, a false output here, and we see another false output here. And basically, what happens is, um, if you 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 must read it, you must read the output of the melee just before the next active edge. So so here's here's the active edge, and you have to read it right in here. So that's correct. This is incorrect. This is correct here, and then it's. Uh, Let's see the falling edge. It should we should be able to read it. Yeah, so we read it right. We read it right here. So it should be zero there. We get a false output here. If we tried to read it there, we would we read it here. Another good place to read it, and so forth. So you can see with Mealy circuits, we do have to be really careful that we only read the circuit at the right time. And if we try and read it uh, right after the clock edge before the next inputs come in it you can have a false have a false reading so we don't ever want to, we don't want to read it then all right so that's what i wanted you to learn from that little exercise hopefully that wasn't too horrifically boring uh it is kind of boring we're never going to do that again i'm never going to test you on that um so that's the end of that um okay let me just say a couple of things these are just for informational purposes not going to test you on it uh but i want you to know about this this general sequential model. Uh, usually in this general model, we, we we number all the states s sub i's, all the outputs z sub i's, all the inputs x sub i's, and all the states the next states s plus sub i's. Okay, and then we for a melee it looks like this. We have uh, we have inputs here. We have outputs here. We might only have one input and one output, like on the last problem. We could have several inputs and one output. We could have one input and several outputs. It, you know, anything's possible. And then we we are, we hold the state, however many states we're going to have, we hold them in some number of flip flops. The minimum number of flip flops, if we have, uh, if if we have, say we have. Uh, uh, say we have uh, 
uh, uh, W states, uh, then we take the log base two and round up to the nearest uh, nearest integer, and that tells us how many flip flops we need at a minimum. Okay. So for three flip-flops, we could have up to eight states. For four, we could have up to 16 states, and so forth. So you can have, if you have n flip-flops, you can have two to the n states. Sometimes we'll actually have a lot more flip-flops than we need, uh, and we'll adopt a different strategy called one hot, um, one hot uh, state assignment, where we just use uh, one flip-flop for every state, and all the other flip-flops are zero except for the one that represents that state, and it's a one. And that has some advantages, particularly in programmable logic where we have extra flip-flops hanging around usually. Okay, so this is the general model for the melee. Now let's, let me, let me erase these real quickly. And uh, we'll, uh, let's see, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Now here is the, here is it is for the more. Now notice what's totally different here is that the the outputs over here the z's they only have input from the fl three flip flops in this case or however many flip flops we have. They don't get direct information from from these inputs over here. The inputs only determine the next state are the inputs to the flip-flops. These are all D flip-flops, not JKs anymore. So these are just gonna be Q pluses, which D is the new D input. It was is always the same as the desired next state. Okay. So notice how in in the more we have a network over here, we have a network over here, we have two different networks. And actually it's often typically the case that that there's more hardware to implement a more. See, that's how you can remember that. A more network takes more hardware. But a melee is kind of squealy. In other words, you, you have to be careful when you read the melee because it's a little more complicated. You must read it right before the next active clock edge. If you read it too soon, you can get a false reading. That's not true with a more. A more can be read any time after the clock edge and the small propagation delay. It's good until the next clock edge. And when the new inputs come in, they don't change the current outputs. So the melee kind of is forward looking and results in less, less circuitry typically, but, uh, but it, a little more complicated to schedule when the output should be read. Okay, let me erase this ink. And uh, so that's all I'm gonna say. Now these, sequen these general models then allow us to write an equation for the next state function S plus and for the output function Zs. So the Z sub i's and the S uh, and the S and the, and the S sub I's, and we write these little functions. We're never going to use this notation again in this circuit in this course. I'm just sort of showing it to you for completeness' sake, uh, and I, I don't think you need to memorize any of this. But you've kind of seen that there is a, sort of this general model idea. All right, okay, I'm done with that. Um, okay, um, I think that's really all I wanted to do. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so I didn't really want to cover anything else today, per se. Uh, I think that was it. Um, some of this was a little bit esoteric and confusing. And uh, so don't worry about the general model. Not going to ask you that on the test. Don't worry about uh, doing the circuit tracing. Uh, that is a task you, that you might wind up doing as an engineer someday. You might have a complicated circuit, and you might have to, to, to simulate it with paper and pencil by hand. Uh, obviously, there are simulation tools. You're using one for your uh, for your projects, your group projects. Um, Simuade uh, or uh, um, uh, Logisim. Simuade that came with the book is also an option, but it, 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 does, it is buggy. Um, but there are many good tools out there, some very expensive tools that are very powerful simulators. And, uh, and so we often, we almost always simulate our hardware before we build it because we want to make sure it's correct, um, and uh, and our simulators are very powerful. So so we generally don't have to do these things by hand like we just did for those two circuits for the melee and the more. Uh, but we went through that to illustrate that you uh, that there is a um, that there is a um, uh, a 
a difference between them in terms of when you can read the, the valid outputs. And with Amelia, you must read them right before the next clock. With the more, you can read them right after the, each clock until the next clock. So they're easier to, to read with the more because you can read them anytime after the clock, minus that tiny propagation delay. But with the melee, you have to make sure that, that the new inputs have come in. And so that's the difference. All right, with that, I'm going to stop. Hopefully, anybody that wanted to take the test has been able to do it. I know initially there was a little confusion. I, I forgot to turn on one of the, I thought, forgot to increase the number of times that you could take it. I had no idea you had to do that. Uh, this is all kind of a new learning curve for me. Um, and a, a lot of these details just aren't clear. But in any event, um, so you have another shot to take it. If anybody wanted to, that's fine. You've got till midnight. And uh, I, I, I don't think I'm going to do a test after this one. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you uh, get by with just one redo today. All right. That's the end. We'll talk to you later.